All right. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, e-invoicing and specifically, I, I think I'll start by saying that e-invoicing, uh, depending on your perspective, uh, has lots of different uh, definitions. In, in this particular case, uh, what we're focusing on today is a lot of the, in, in the international space, um, we're talking about essentially government regulations that are driving the need for e-invoicing. Um, and so uh, the, the perspective from the U.S. market is uh, a little different than that of um, other countries. Um, but the main driver here is that, that there is so much activity and in, in government-related regulation uh, driving changes internationally that um, it, it bears uh, kind of us explaining uh, <laughs> what is going on in those markets that is driving activity that, that will eventually affect uh, the way invoices are traded in the U.S. Um, so we're going to begin kind of with a global uh, perspective, and we will then drill into some of the, the specifics. Um, I've got some examples from various different jurisdictions, various different uh, countries and regulations. Um, and then reflect a little bit on on what implications that has for companies that either um, have customers or suppliers in those districts or that are actually doing business in different parts of the world that could very well be impacted by a lot of these changes. With that said, I'll, I'll start with a very high level um, view of kind of the international e-invoicing market. All we're really demonstrating here is that that the the drivers toward e-invoicing are largely being led if you look at the leader uh, countries here uh, from a few different countries um, probably the most uh, the most prominent among them being Mexico as being a, one of the earliest uh, adopters of regulations around e-invoicing um, with their uh, CFDI regulations. Um, some other countries uh, in South America quickly followed suit based on the success of, uh, of Mexico's programs and, and then followed by um, Sweden, Finland, um, as well as a lot of the European countries. So you see we've got um, the United States marked as as average in terms of uh, adoption of e-invoicing. Um, truthfully, the, the United States doesn't really have any regulations around uh, e-invoicing, but as you'll soon see, um, their countries around the world are slowly adopting regulations, and it's it's going to be important to be able to interact with uh, those countries as these regulations um, become firmer in, in local law. So what's driving all this? We'll, we'll get into this, but uh, the, the primary driver here is uh, the ability for countries to collect tax. Um, and I think in, especially in the case of Mexico, um, it was important for them to, to be able to collect uh, the tax that was due the government. And um, they were finding that with self-reporting and, and um, with no real regulations in place that, that uh, a tax gap developed between what should have been paid and what was actually paid. And so the more closely that they can monitor uh, the invoices that are distributed and the amount of tax that is due to the government, uh, the quicker they can narrow that tax gap. So. Um, We'll take a look at this in um, in a little more detail. Uh, in this particular case, we're pointing out, in, specifically in Germany, given the fact that Seaburger is, is based in Germany, um, that's often the perspective we come from, but um, I think it's also important to point out that, that uh, Seaburger does business in about 50 different countries, and so we are frequently um, exposed to 
to the various different regulations in all parts of the world. Um, but in terms of drivers of policy, uh, the, the single kind of most important thing that is, is pushing forward these d different government regulations is, in fact, uh, the government's ability to collect uh, tax income. So if we look more closely at uh, the EU, um, you can see once again in terms of uh, the leaders, uh, Sweden, Finland, um, a little bit ahead of the remaining uh, EU member states. But once again, uh, this is taken from a report 2015 looking at the, the VAT value added tax um, gap estimates as a percent of revenue. And as you can see, with a 12.7% with a median, um, you know, all of the countries in Europe have a vested interest in um, controlling more closely uh, the tax revenue that is due to each of those member states. Um, probably one of the more significant out of this group is, is perhaps Italy at 23 plus percent, um, a gap in, in uh, the tax they're taking in versus what what is due. So, um, and then on the other end of the scale, um, you, you've got, for example, Sweden, uh, almost a, a negative gap there, um, or perhaps collected more than they should have. So, um, what can be seen here is that those member states that have enacted um, government regulation that needs to be adhered to with regard to invoicing have have narrowed that gap. And um, in, in the most of these countries in the average uh, are in the process of implementing or implementing progressively uh, stronger regulations with regard to regulating the format and, um, and the methods of exchanging invoices. So uh, as if we look specifically uh, at the European Union, the total there is $151 billion um, in lost revenue or gap between uh, what should have been paid and what was re what was remitted. So again, from a from a high level, um, this is a large driver behind tightening up uh, regulations. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, e-invoicing has uh, lots of different definitions depending on your perspective. Some might consider uh, EDI in general, um, especially in North America, the exchange of ANSI X12 documents as being an electronic invoice. Uh, true, it is. And, um, and obviously the vast majority of CBER customers are in fact exchanging um, EDI in some form or another. Uh, now, with that being said, with every, every company, uh, usually it is a, a, a sales, sales focused type of transaction that is automated first. Uh, sometimes the buy side of, of a company is, is, um, is kind of integrated second as a, as a, um, an automated, um, transaction. But the trend that we're showing here is, is that this whole, whole idea of, of, um, regulations driving adoption is is what we're trying to illustrate here. So if you look at the, the Tax Simplification Act in mid-2011 um, and then the successive um, different directives, so directives from the European Union, these, these initial directives, and we'll look at these a little more, but as these become closer to individual law in each country, um, we have seen the adoption of, of electronic methods increase. Um, I, I will acknowledge that my graph here is, is perhaps not to scale. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the inset box here, 70% paper, 30% some type of electronic. Well, the, the graph at 2017 almost looks like a 50-50 split. Um, but then nonetheless, the point is that is that there is an upward trend with that trend as it relates to regulations being um, for the European Union, the replacement of a paper or image based uh, a paper 
based invoice altogether uh, by 2020. Um, so the trend is really what's important here. And, and as I said, there are different flavors as to what you might consider an electronic invoice. Uh, certainly, uh, EDI is electronic, but also the delivery of a PDF image, many people consider to be electronic, um, as well as some type of uh, XML-based standard uh, along with a PDF. And the reason that these are all broken out is that when we look um, in a few minutes at the detail, uh, each of the the governments in their uh, in the different types of programs that they've put in place have used a combination of all of these things, um, all of these elements, to to regulate and to be able to validate and report on uh, invoicing activity. So, uh, as I said, it, it's it's the public sector that is behind a lot of this, and this is where these regulations are starting. So um, again, the, the important thing from the U.S. perspective is the trend. And, and the way this trend is moving is that these uh, directives coming out of the EU are initially focused on a, a concept in the form of a directive. And then those directives are taken and implemented into law by the individual member states. Um, and so so some of these guidelines, the, the initial ones that are in process, are focused on public procurement, for example, or, um, or electronic invoicing for public contracts, so things where, where you're doing business with the government. And so uh, this isn't necessarily, um, you know, doesn't directly impact U.S. companies um, insofar as they're, they're doing business in those those uh, different countries, but again, the for internal um, entities that are doing business with the government, this is where the the laws the teeth first start to to kick in, um, and the point, especially within the EU, is that um, there are lots of different administrations and lots of different uh, different entities that are doing business with the government. So that's where they're starting, right? Um, and as, as I've got here in the, uh, the first bullet is that 14 countries have already implemented um, or announced the, the obligation for invoicing for business to government. Um, so obviously the, the progression of that is that, that as those programs uh, become more commonplace, then the, the efficiencies gained there are likely to be extended to um, doing business with any party. Um, and so, and, and of course, for the co companies that are operating with any to these different countries, um, there is a lot of potential that, that they're already having a significant portion of their business um, may in fact involve business with the government. Um, so again, public sector is, is within uh, within this tax gap type of trend, the public sector is kind of the first step. Um, if we take a look at that, and we'll look at this pretty quickly, but uh, speaking directly from, from the German perspective, um, their progression has been uh, in November of this year that all federal ministries and constitutional bodies must be able to receive and process electronic invoices. So. Uh, the next step is that the following year um, that all contracting authorities must be able to receive and process electronic invoices. And then the third step is that um, anyone doing business in the public sec sector issuing invoices over a thousand euro um, must be in electronic form. So this is one example of how, how the, the laws are becoming in increasingly kind of a rollout, if you will, of the electronic invoice requirements. If we look elsewhere in uh, European Union, um, Austria 2014 has already um, jumped on the bandwagon early um, with their e-invoicing program, Italy 2015 uh, with the Futura um, program, and we'll take a look at that one in a little more detail. Spain 
2015, France 2016. Um, so what what you're seeing is, is the the rollout of each of these member states in the EU um, that are are putting in place formal programs uh, to manage the the standards, the consistency, and the validation of uh, invoices. So now I, I think we've addressed this for the most part, um, but if you look at the drivers here, as we've said, the, the the primary one right now in Europe has been business to government. Um, and so, and, and thus the, the associated legislation. Um, the second one is the regulations that result from it and the, the, uh, the attempt to, to narrow that, that tax gap. Um, so putting regulations around the clearance of invoices. And then the third one, which really I think is, is more generic and more applicable to um, what companies in the United States are paying attention to, is that there are some cost efficiencies that, that can be gained um, from, from tighter automation of the invoicing process. Uh, certainly, um, if, if, you, if you draw a comparison between the idea of um, creating a paper invoice and delivering that via mail, um, there are lots of efficiencies uh, that can be gained really on both sides in terms of uh, processing electronic invoices. So back to the example of, of, of paper, um, you know, certainly anyone could argue these numbers. I, I've, uh, I've been working with invoice automation for probably the past 10 years um, and and in procurement related uh, processes for 10 years prior to that, I've seen many different numbers uh, proposed here as to what the true cost of an invoice is. So um, it's, it's less, maybe the, the, the absolute number is probably not really the point um, or the percentage cost savings. Some companies may benefit significantly more than others. Um, but the general ideas, I, I think, uh, many could understand, which is that, you know, on the supply side, you no longer have to print an envelope and mail and and uh, pay for postage and and those types of things, and and then the softer costs of um, um, trying to improve your remittance processes, uh, sending reminders, um, and and trying to get that invoice paid uh, on, on the supply side. And then on the buyer side, um, the idea of being able to take in an invoice in an electronic manner, automate it, the matching process to confirm that that invoice is, is valid. Um, and, and then also having the, the efficiencies gained from um, being able to forward and approve in an electronic fashion, as well as automatically archive uh, that that document. Um, those are the types of things that result in both hard and soft cost uh, savings for both sides. And I think that that's an older story in the in the typical um, justification for for invoice automation. But at the same time, it, it does play well into um, why a lot of these different um, countries and companies are adopting. Um, a larger percentage of electronic invoicing. So when we talk about the the regulatory um, programs that have been put in place, there are generally two flavors of them. Um, one of those is is a process based program, which is the more detailed of the two. Um, it involves real-time controls uh, and, and real-time processes for clearing and approving uh, the invoice. And we'll get into the details of, of what that looks like. The other type is, is what we call a post-audit um, process. And so most of the European Union has, has some type of post-audit requirements, um, which require a certain uh, uh, put regulations around 
the need to store and be able to recover that invoice for audit purposes. And, and I think that's the one that is, is more aligned with uh, U.S.-based regulations in terms of um, in terms of preserving documents and being able to, after the fact, uh, either justify or demonstrate in the course of an audit uh, the validity of, of invoices. So these are the two different uh, different programs that are different um, requirements that we see within the invoice lifecycle. Uh, it's important to note that it's it's this clearance process where a lot of the the um, government regulations are tightening up on exactly what is required there. So if we look at the, again, back to our, our world map of um, where there are certain regulations in place and the, you know, again, we've got basically South America as being the leader in, in real time kind of controls around the clearance process and and then a lot of the rest of the world has some type of, of post audit uh, regulations. Um, and this is where you see that the US really is not, um, doesn't have any active legislation or, or emerging legislation that is putting strong regulations around how to, how to process invoices. Uh, the point is that lots of different countries around the world are and uh, at some point, um, there, there's going to be a, a convergence there, or maybe if, if your company moves into new markets or through global um, consolidation or acquisition, these become become issues where, uh, in order to to play nice with these countries, you've got to be able to understand some of those those regulations. So. Um, getting down into to the kind of the clearance processes uh, that are involved um, this is a very simplified diagram here um, and essentially you know th this for portugal spain hungary um, this is kind of a what we describe as a unilateral process where uh, the person person or the the company issuing the invoice is reporting to some central authority uh, the the tax information, and that way the the that central authority has record of of that transaction. The invoice is issued to the buyer, and the buyer then knows um, that they need to remit you know whatever uh, the tax is. Uh, because it's also been reported to uh, a state agency of some sort. Um, in in the case of Hungary, I think Hungary is one that um, most recently has implemented where, where you know, there there are significant fines uh, related to um, any uh, deviation from or failure to pay um, and comply with with these regulations. Um, we'll take a look at Italy, but this is more the, the model that emerged out of, uh, Latin America. So, um, this is a, a scenario and this is the one where, um, where you've got a bilateral, uh, transaction going on where, uh, you, you issue the invoice to a central authority of some sort or a, an agent working on behalf of the state um, and you get clearance to issue the invoice um, and then once that that invoice is issued um, then the buyer again interacts with that state agent to um, get clearance from the agency and then validate the invoice so you, you've got multiple points of communication here that, that enter the picture. You've got formats that need to be uh, adhered to with regard to the different agents, state agencies that are involved. And this is where, where things get a little tricky to follow, especially when you're, you're looking on a country by country basis. So um, 
I've taken the first uh, example here. This is definitely kind of an eye chart. Um, but this is an example of the process for Italy's um, SDI system, uh, which SDI basically stands for system interchange system, Sistema de Interscambio. But um, but they so so their invoicing program is based on this SDI system, and that SDI uh, interaction involves a couple of different things. So so you see the invoice issuer can transmit a document. Now, typically, that document's coming out of an ERP system. They may already have uh, EDI to transform that document into Edifact or into, in, in the case of North America, likely X12. Uh, but in this case, the conversion needs to be done into a specific um, Fatura type of XML, which is a format mandated by by um, the Italy regulations. In this case, that message also has to be signed um, with a di digital signature, and then it has to be transmitted through a specific interface. And in the case that we're, we're illustrating here, it's, it's communication via a web service. So all of a sudden, you've got lots of different components here um, in order to comply with this particular process. This, you've got a new type of translation, a new type of XML format, uh, the need for a signature, and the need to support transmission via a web service. Um, and then uh, once that is transmitted to the, the SDI system, they validate the format of the XML um, as well as the signature and and that it's a, a valid in format, valid in content, according to business rules, and then that invoice is delivered to the recipient. Um, there also needs to be a feedback loop. Uh, if anything fails, then the the rejection or the, the failure is sent back to the one issuing the invoice. Um, so this is an example of probably and a number of a number of countries have have taken uh, this particular approach, which is you have uh, you have a unique format, you have a unique type of communication, you have some requirements around signatures, and you have a central body. Now that central body may be a single government entity, or in the case of Mexico, which we'll see in the next slide, uh, that that central body may be um, a partner, an authorized third party. To uh, to validate these these invoices, um, and then subsequent to all of that processing, uh, there may be the need for archiving, and that archiving could take place uh, either internally in your if you already have an archiving system, or it could be facilitated by a third party. Um, given the number of formats that are in play here, that's why you see, for example, is you've got a uh, four different types of, of documents. You've got uh, the, the Fatura, in this case, XML document. Uh, many, of these, many of these regulations mandate uh, an accompanying human readable form as well, in, in, in this case, a PDF document, so that rather than reading XML, you'd be able to visually pull that up in a, in a human readable file. And then You've also got likely the source file uh, that you'd want to have archived as well. So, um, if we move to the Mexico scenario, um, a very similar one in that you've got an, an original document that needs to be transformed. In this case, their format is CFDI XML, um, where they have defined what that format needs to be. They've also got uh, a signature step, and um, and then in their case, they've they've got these um, the PAC, which is an is authorized um, uh, certification provider, and so this is kind of a distributed model where there are a number of different um, providers of this certification service, um, but in this case, you get all of these official documents then need to be routed routed through that certification process 
And then once they're certified, you're sending, as you see in points six and seven below, you're sending um, a document to the invoice recipient in two formats. One is CFDI XML and two, the, the readable PDF file. Um, as you see in this case, the, the, there is less um, restriction on the way that communication takes place, uh, whether that be via EDI or web service or whatever. In this case, um, an email server is sufficient to deliver those documents. The important point to uh, the government is that those documents have been uh, generated in the proper format and validated before they were sent to the invoice recipient. So uh, you've got this central reporting agency that's able to, to monitor um, that, that whole process. So these are just two examples, uh, two of, of many, where uh, different governments have settled on what they want their regulations to be, what the standards are, what the standards for communication, uh, for, for document formatting, et cetera, um, need to be. And, and this is where it becomes difficult for, for a single company that may be doing business in multiple countries and be subject to these requirements to follow those, all of those regulations. Um, never mind the fact that, that especially, I think we saw this with Hungary leading up to their, their live implementation of these latest regulations. There were, I believe, in two weeks leading up to the deadline, there were eight or ten changes to the standard um, that that any participants needed to be aware of and, and make changes to their program so they could adhere to that standard. So if, if you look across the board with each government instituting programs like this, all of which have standards that need to be followed, keeping current with those becomes a real challenge. So um, I guess this is just a high level slide to say where does Seaburger fit, fit into this? Um, and, um, and so if, if you look at the, the wheel on the right, um, this is a high level representation really of the areas that Seaburger as a, as a business integration software company addresses um, so this is this e-invoicing fits neatly into the various other um, central parts of our business primarily being uh, integration with uh, b2b as well as security around managed file transfer um, and api eai integration um, this is just another outgrowth of that that core which is the ability to integrate systems and the ability to to handle multiple formats and handle document conversion um, when faced with all of these e-invoicing uh, requirements it's it's a natural solution for Seaburg to leverage uh, the the capabilities that we have to put put programs in place to address um, these requirements as as they evolve um, and that comes in the form of really two things. Um, we have developed services around uh, the, the issuance and monitoring of invoices. Even if we look independently of government regulations, um, we have developed services for invoice delivery through an electronic method and the ability to monitor the delivery of those invoices and, and even at the far extreme to to be able to integrate with your master data and perform matching capabilities um, to be able to validate and clear invoices. Um, and then we, we also offer the invoicing gateway, which, uh, which enables us to, to plug in one or more of these different programs uh, to handle e-invoicing. Um, in, in the detail that we've described in the previous slides with regard to specific countries and specific regulations. So um, essentially, if you, if you look at where Seaburger can offer services, um, 
it's in the this middle piece where you've got a number of things going on. You've got uh, transmission via a, a variety of different protocols. Um, you've got different formats regulated by by the different international tax authorities. Um, and then you've got transmission on the other end to your invoice recipients. Um, and so the, the Seaburger Cloud Services uh, enables us to facilitate that communication as well as the transformation and, and the uh, conversion of documents into and out of uh, the different formats required by, by different local authorities. So some of those key functions, I think I've, I've mentioned uh, a lot of them, but but some of those key functions are are automating the the integration with ERP environments, um, converting, as I've said earlier, uh, into country specific formats that might not be known to even if you you've got local EDI resources um, dealing with. Uh, you know, those local resources might be accustomed to dealing with, say, X12 requirements um, based on ANSI transactions, but they might not be um, so well versed in dealing with a, a Fatura XML, for example. So um, this is where we're, we're we're bringing the experience of of having dealt with these different countries and different institutions um, and different formats. Um, you can benefit from Seaburger's experience there. Um, again, the, the the transfer to specific tax authorities. Uh, like I said, sometimes this is a central authority that requires registration, and that registration process can be um, difficult depending on on um, which country it is. Uh, again, we've already solved those different registration issues, so. So there's no need to go repeat that process uh, every time. We've, and so you benefit from some efficiency there in terms of uh, already having connectivity to those different authorities. Um, delivery of the invoice, that's uh, kind of a, the bread and butter of what Seaburger uh, has long done in terms of uh, delivery over various different protocols. Um, and then long-term archiving, if that's necessary, that can be either facilitated through communication to uh, a local archiving system or can be fully supported um, with a, a cloud-based service to handle that long-term archiving. Um, as with all Seaburger Cloud Services, there's visibility of all these transactions through, um, through uh, browser-based utilities to, to be able to see these transactions, um, and then certainly on on the for for any cloud-based services, there's um, the system operation and maintenance and maintaining SLAs to ensure the system is always always available and running. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, most importantly, the change management, uh, the, the the change implications of keeping up with the tax authorities in different uh, countries and, and keeping up with the, the subsequent uh, perhaps changes to formatting or changes to document standards. Um, this is all something that is, is managed in an ongoing proactive manner um, with regard to all the different, different countries that are supported. So, um, here is a partial list of, uh, of some of the different standards that exist. Um, some of these you might might have heard of. We've, we've mentioned uh, the CFDI in Mexico. There's Zuckerford in Germany. Um, in fact, two different uh, German local requirements. Um, Spain, we've mentioned. France uh, has a couple of the DMAT uh, is one EDI requirement. Uh, around B2B, and then Chorus Pro is uh, another around business-to-government transactions. Italy, um, Austria, Hungary, we've also mentioned. So these are examples of each of these programs comes with uh, kind of like the eye chart we saw a few minutes ago. Each of these programs comes with their own set of requirements, um, you know, that, that are specific to that country. Um, 
So they all have some flavor of um, transformation required. Uh, some of them have electronic signature and validation, some do not. And uh, so, but again, the ability to support um, those types of uh, electronic signatures and uh, is is can become a requirement and one that we can uh, can address. Uh, confirmed delivery is another big uh, issue there. Um, and then there's the possibility of of altering the status or uh, error handling um, where you've got documents that for one reason or another are not validated and there needs to be a feedback loop to to reprocess that document as well. Um, so these are some of the elements that almost all of these these regulations and programs uh, have in them. So um, we've mentioned a couple of things, specifically uh, the need for for signatures. Um, our invoicing e-invoicing partner Trustweaver uh, plays a role here in. Um, and not only the legal requirements uh, related to each of the local jurisdictions, but also some of the enhanced services that, that can be provided around e-invoicing, specifically with regard to signatures and long-term archiving. This is where uh, Trustweaver comes in. They lend their expertise with regard to um, also the audit and legal requirements and as well as a few special services related to time stamping uh, which is, is in some cases required by um, the local authorities um, and we mentioned the, the the process of of clearance and matching so the what we're joining here we're a partner with trust weaver what we're joining here is that their capabilities uh, on, on a um, from a global perspective as well as uh, the Seaburger capabilities, which are, are uh, related to transformation and uh, communication across a, a wide variety of, of different uh, formats and protocols. So um, I think we've we've reached the last slide here. Um, the, just in summary. Um, there is definitely a trend toward um, toward digitization of invoices. Uh, what we try to do here today is, is give you a feel for where that trend started and and um, and how it might affect you. Um, as we're seeing in the in those different maps of the world, there are clearance systems and programs uh, that are gradually um, becoming part of local law in a variety of different flavors. Um, and in that variety of different flavors is where the complexity lies. So um, as, as trade becomes even more global um, and, and as you have requirements to deal with different local authorities, uh, this is where it becomes difficult to to follow all of the the moving parts and and keep up with them, um, and and this is where uh, you run into each of these programs having its own unique requirements um, requires some flexibility in terms of uh, the ability to communicate via different modes, whether they they be through some type of file transfer or through a web service or whatever. Uh, there's a technical uh, flexibility that, that's often required and, and often d difficult to maintain uh, that in-house. So, um, so our recommendations: um, work with uh, someone who knows the national or international requirements in various different countries. Uh, we've given you some samples uh, today. As I said, Seaburger does business in all of these countries, and and for the last four or five years has been working and following uh, a lot of this legislation. Uh, just in the last year or two, we're starting to see a lot of those firm dates uh, come into play, uh, where where the kind of the the final opportunity. I think we saw the example earlier in 
in the EU that by by 2020 that um, what is currently a government related um, requirement for doing business with the government will evolve over time to uh, kind of a de facto requirement for business to business uh, type transactions. So, um, and I, I guess finally be uh, highly flexible and adaptable through someone who can provide the solutions either uh, through on-premises software or through um, cloud or hybrid solutions. So uh, in some cases, you may already have your local uh, EDI software, um, and, 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 and that's fine, and that may be serving your local markets. But if there's the introduction, for example, of uh, a new division or a new unit that suddenly is, is subject to uh, the invoicing laws in Mexico, um, then rather than retool that your your um, EDI capabilities or your you know whether it's for encryption or whether it's for um, any of the other requirements that might be introduced by those regulations, um, in many cases it might make more sense to um, to use a provider who is capable of not only meeting those requirements but any future requirements you may have. So I think we've reached the end of uh, at least the prepared material that we had for you. Um, went a little bit longer than we'd anticipated, but I think we've still got a few minutes left for questions. Um, and certainly if, if I cannot answer your questions, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, these back to, to our experts, uh, either in, in our headquarters or um, through our partners at Trustweaver to try to get answers that you might have, might need. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. That was definitely a deeper dive just to show the complexity of e invoicing in even 50 minutes. <laughs> that was great. Um, we can now accept questions. Um, please post your questions in the question box. We're going to stay online for a moment and see what comes through. Um, but if you do feel like you're good and, and, and have an understanding and just need to get to your next meeting, thank you all for attending. I will send you Ed's presentation and recording um, this afternoon. And feel free to reach out to me so I can connect you to Ed if you'd like a one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, for your unique situation. Um, so we'll just sit here for a moment and uh, be happy to answer any of your questions. So I have a question here. Hi, Ed. Any sense for how long until the U.S. starts requiring e-invoicing? You know, I was just talking about that yesterday with uh, with our VP of Sales, and and um, from a strictly from a policy perspective, I don't have any sense. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that um, that uh, there are currently, you know. IRS regulations that are already in place for things like uh, document archiving for X number of years and things like that. Uh, although we have not yet seen um, a big movement toward um, any of these that, that kind of enforce tax compliance. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have a sense for that. I guess the probably the message that we really wanted to convey today is is that um, it, looking at the international market, hello. Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I've lost. Um Ed, as far as hearing him, can somebody... Clearly, there's a some handwriting's on the wall for any company that does business uh, outside of the U.S. 
Great, Ed. Hey, I'd lost you there for a moment. <laughs> it had gone silent. Um, so I have something, you know, from a marketing perspective, we went to the Exchange Summit um, this spring in uh, Miami, which is a small summit, a pretty exclusive summit of maybe a couple of hundred um, attendees. Uh, and one of the big discussions in keynote speakers was about regulations in the state. So there are discussions going on, maybe on a smaller scale. But I think, again, what we're trying to just let you know and convey is that the things are in movement and the momentum is starting to take uh, a, a real uh, a real capacity as these governments are recognizing the tax gap that they have. And with the slide that we had from 2014 to 15, seeing how these regulations are actually working for them. So... It is definitely coming down the pipeline and the and there are U.S. regulation talks in place. So do we have any more questions? I'll just wait just a few more moments. Okay, well, then I would say we will conclude and this segment and uh, we will be doing more in the future. We will include you into our mailing list so we can keep you informed and give you the opportunity to join in as we might be uh, going deeper into the different countries um, on different webinars. We do have um, a webinar on e-invoicing in Mexico. Um, I can send and add that this afternoon as well. So you can just see uh, a deeper dive into one city, uh, into one country. And with that being said, I thank you and we'll be saying goodbye at this moment.